The Watership Down podcast is intended for listeners who are familiar with the plot. There will be spoilers. This episode is scripted, narrated, recorded and edited by Newell Fisher. Hello, and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 177, which is being recorded in my garden, in which we will be looking at the first 10-minute segment of the second episode of the 2018 Netflix version of Watership Down. First, though, one bit of borough keeping. We will be on holiday in Cornwall for the first week of August, which is a well-deserved break after the last couple of years, so for the first time I'm recording episodes well in advance. Up to now, the recording date has always been the release date. This episode was recorded on the 24th of July, 2024. Please be aware that this means that until mid-August, episodes may not respond to up-to-date comments on the YouTube channel, or indeed any wider events in the world. Anyway, let's go to the farm. Introduction to Episode 2, The Raid The second episode of this miniseries is unique among the four episodes in that it runs three separate storylines at the same time, each of which are dealt with separately in the book. The action switches between them in a way that maintains tension and makes thematic links between the storylines. As a bit of filmmaking it is quite effective, but it does make a linear comparison with the chapters of the book a little tricky, and it will infuriate any originalists among you. The three storylines are The Digging of the Warren on Watership Down, involving Hawkbit, Dandelion, Strawberry and Kiha. The Raids, and yes I do mean plural, on Nuthanger Farm, involving Hazel, Bigwig and Fiverr. And The Diplomatic Mission to Ephrafa, involving Holly, Blackberry and Bluebell. This division into three simultaneous storylines will begin from the second segment next week. But for now, our rabbit friends are still all together on Watership Down where they are about to be joined by someone else. Netflix series, Episode 2, Part 1. Kihar. Part 1 of Episode 2, The Raid, runs from the start to 9 minutes exactly, and the reverse timings are 49.45, to 4045. The equivalent chapters from the book are chapters 20 to 23, from a honeycomb and a mouse to Kiha. There is also an element of chapter 27. You can't imagine it unless you've been there. We see Holly's sad face reflected in water and hear a gentle wind. A leaf lands gently in the water and Holly watches it float past. We now see Hazel join him, also reflected in the water. As a brief aside, this is the pond on Chalk Downland that I discussed way back in episode 16 at 5 minutes 45. The only way it could be there is if it were a human-made dew pond, and there isn't one on the actual warship down, as far as I know. And now we see them both properly. Hazel asks Holly if he is ready to tell him what happened to Sandalford. In the book, Holly and Bluebell tell their terrible tale to the whole warren in the honeycomb. Here, it will be for Hazel Ra only. Holly says that the Thraera decided there was no point in pursuing those who had left Sandalford further. The next day, the terrible events began. In a clever transition, Holly is suddenly back underground on his own at Sandalford Warren. He looks around nervously as we hear rumbling and thudding from above, and earth falls from the roof. As it gets worse, we hear screams from further off. And now he is running with other rabbits telling them to get to the slack run, the escape route that Bluebell uses to escape in the book, while Holly helplessly watches the destruction of Sandalford from above ground. As the choral music in the background gets more strident, the situation gets more panicked. The number of escape routes is diminishing. We see Holly get knocked down in the panic and groups of huddled rabbits not knowing what to do. They end up trapped in a large burrow as yellow gas pools on the floor around them and then some of them try to dig their way out, but it is too late. They start to climb over one another to escape the gas. A crush begins. Everything becomes chaos. And then we see the digger bucket 
of a human excavator full of earth and a rabbit who falls to the ground, still moving. This detail is easy to miss, but I think this is Holly, who against all the odds is literally dug out of the ground by pure chance, surviving where those around him were buried. Finally, there is a peaceful scene of the notice board at Sandalford Warren, with three diggers preparing the ground for a new housing estate in the distance. The kind of scene a human wouldn't look twice at. This sequence may not have had the visceral horror of the equivalent from the 1978 film, but it has told its story well all the same, and we are left in no doubt as to the fate of Sandalford Warren. And now we are back at the pond on Watership Down, as Holly explains that his injuries were sustained at the hands of his friends and family as he tried to escape. Hazel asks why humans would do that. Holly doesn't know, but what is clear is that humans must be avoided at all costs. Holly continues. He managed to get out and tracked Hazel and co. We see him limp across the road, then approaching the copse where Fiverr saw Watership Down for the first time. On the morning of the third day, he has an encounter which explains his statement when he first arrived on Watership Down that they were in danger. In a misty field, he encounters a panicking rabbit with rough, ragged ears. This rabbit asks if Holly got his injuries from the Ephrathans. He warns him to leave these hills and never return. This scene is slightly reminiscent of the encounter with the hare that Holly and his companions have in the book while on their way to Ephrapha. But it is important to note that here Holly is left with no idea what an Ephrapha actually is and he does not see Ephrapha at all, unlike in the 1978 film where he reaches Watership Down via Ephrapha. A highly unlikely journey if you know the actual geography of the Watership Down landscape for which the 1978 film stood trial in episode 72. And of course, at this point, neither we nor Holly have any idea that the rabbit we have just met is none other than Blackavar. For in this version, as in the 1999 TV series, Ephrapha is not two days' journey away. It is, to borrow a phrase, a clear and present danger. As Holly looks on at the fleeing Blackavar in confusion, the titles for episode two, The Raid, are shown. And now we see a pleasant summer's day on Watership Down, and we actually see rabbits digging a warren there. For despite the previous shot that confusingly seemed to show holes already present, it is now clear that there are none. In fact, generally, this mini-series is very good at showing rabbits digging. But of course, these are buck rabbits, and therefore not very good at it. Bluebell turns to Hazel and says he can't believe Sandalford is gone. Hazel agrees, saying Five was right. A little way away, Dandelion is frenziedly digging next to Hawkbit, who looks a little concerned. Meanwhile, Bigwig is not satisfied with his work, saying his scrape looks like it was dug by a moon-crazed badger. He says bucks can't dig. Dandelion's frenzied digging has reached a crescendo, and Hawkbit, who is getting showered in earth, feels forced to stop him roughly. I think it is Blackberry who admonishes, admonishes them for fighting. Bigwig makes it clear that the reason for the urgency of digging is the perceived danger from the Ephrathans, but Bucks can't dig. He goes up to Hazel and says they need does. Fiverr agrees, outlining what does bring to a warren. Blackberry points out that there was, there was at least one doe in the hutch at the farm they passed on the way to Watership Down. Hazel lies by pretending he doesn't remember. Bluebell mocks him for this, saying how lovingly they stared into each other's eyes. Hazel says they are not going back to the farm or anywhere near humans. As he starts digging again, Bigwick goes up to him. He reminds Hazel that they have eight bucks and just one doe. This means there will be fighting, which will be his fault. And so it is that, once again, this Hazel's leadership is undermined by the need to give in to Bigwig. In the book, raiding Nuttanger Farm was Hazel's idea, but not here. Hazel angrily breaks off from digging to insist that they are not going anywhere near humans, and that is an increasingly desperate-sounding order. This conflict is interrupted by something swooping over them with a high-pitched cry. It crashes in long grass nearby. We see that it is a seagull. Cautiously, with Bigwig in the lead, they creep towards it. It suddenly lunges at Bigwig. 
So far as it has not spoken, let alone used any bad language. And as Hazel now approaches, he says that it seems to be starving as it pecks the earth. Blackberry adds that it looks wounded. At last, Hazel is granted a moment of unfettered leadership as he looks up at the sky, then back at the bird. He has had an idea and says they need to feed him. He tells them to dig up grubs. Bigwig, of course, thinks this is insane. But Hazel points out that it, it can see other warrens from the air. Hazel's mention that this includes does changes Bigwig's mind instantly. He even laughs about it. And the Lapine bug hunt is on. We join Hawkbit and Strawberry in, in the beach hangar. He turns over a piece of rotten wood exposing many bugs. Strawberry thanks him for his gallantry, which makes Hawkbit look hopeful. He mentions some sow thistle he saw earlier and wonders if she would like to go there with him later to <clears throat> Silflay. Strawberry says he is so sweet in a way that suggests it is a firm no from her. She picks up a bug and leaves. Hopbit tells her to remember what he said about Dandelion, who promptly arrives. He is angry. Apparently someone has told Strawberry he has the white blindness and he thinks it was Hawkbit. Time out. I don't think the writer did their research here. The white blindness is myxomatosis, a deadly virus to rabbits that was used deliberately to decimate rabbit populations in Britain in the 1950s, resulting in a 99% drop in our wild rabbit population. Considering that this was just over 10 years before when Watership Down is set, this is rather like saying someone has bubonic plague in 1670s London. As a flirtation technique, it is not exactly subtle. Hawkbit says prove it, picks up a bug and leaves. It is night time now, and we hear the seagull speak for the first time as he tells the rabbits to bring him more worms. So, what does this keyha sound like? Well, he's Scottish. Nothing wrong with that, of course. The actor voicing him, Peter Capaldi, is Scottish himself and is just using his own accent, presumably. Only here's the thing. Mini rant incoming. Hazel is voiced by James McAvoy, who is also Scottish. But to play Hazel, he adopts a Southern English received pronunciation accent, like mine, in fact. A key feature of the character of Kihar is his foreignness, last heard in the straight portrayal of him as a Russian-sounding female seagull in the 2016 BBC radio play. As I said, when we went through that version, laughing at funny foreign accents has become less acceptable in recent years, and you certainly wouldn't be likely to see a portrayal of Kihar such as Zero Mustels in the 1978 film these days. So the makers of this version have played it safe by giving Kihar a British accent, because, of course, Scotland is part of the island of Britain. So that's OK then. Well, not really. Because if that's the case, then why doesn't James McAvoy get to use his Scottish accent? Because all the rabbits need to sound like they come from the same place, I hear you cry. Fair enough, I suppose. But the actual effect here is that by trying to play it safe with Kihar's accent, what they've actually done is other the Scots. And there has been quite enough of that in British history. This is a classic example of modern good intentions having the opposite effect, in my humble opinion. Or am I just being a little too Gen X about this? Rant over. The seagull describes worms to his newfound carers as Hazel remarks to Bigwig that he seems to be recovering. Bigwig thinks the seagull is loathsome as Hazel approaches him. The seagull is bemoaning the stupidity of his rescuers as Hazel asks his, him his name, which is of course Kihar. He asks how Kihar was hurt. His reply is defensive, but eventually he admits that he was attacked by a farm cat. Hazel then comes straight out with asking his favour of Kihar rather than the more subtle persuasion of the book. Will Kihar look for other warrens for them? Kihar says he will think about it, pretends to do so for a few moments, then says no, spits at Hazel and laughs loudly. As Hazel and Bigwig move away, Bigwig angrily asks him what the plan is now. Perhaps a field mouse can make them doze out of straw. They are interrupted by the sight of Hawkbit and Dandelion fighting viciously. As they part and square up, Bigwig and Strawberry keep them apart. Bigwig then turns on Hazel. He says he warned they would be fighting, and this will only be the beginning of it. There is tension as Hawkbit and Dandelion continue to square up. Hazel, yet again under pressure from Bigwig, comes to a decision. He, Fiverr and Bigwig will leave for the farm at dawn. Everyone else will stay on the down. He doesn't want to risk everyone. And so, once again, this Hazel is forced to react to events rather than leading them.
comparison with the book. Holly's account of the destruction of Sandalford, which is actually based on Bluebell's account from inside the Warren in the book, is presented more as the reality of what such a horrific experience would be like, as opposed to the more stylized representation of the 1978 film. His subsequent encounter with Blackavar in The Mist sets up a storyline that is different from any previous version of Watership Down, where the word Ephraphim initially means some unknown new form of Elil. I'm not really sure why they decided to do this other than wanting a way to cram Ephrafer into the first episode in some form. This miniseries is very good at showing rabbits actually digging, and it is good to see a film version at last in which the Warren on Watership Down is begun from scratch. However, the idea of raiding Nuthanger Farm being taken away from Hazel is yet another undermining both of his authority and audacity as a leader, as again he is forced to react to the emotions of others in the group on the spot. Kihar's arrival provides welcome relief from the conflict over the does, but the crude way in which Hazel puts his idea to Kihar and its rejection undermines him yet again, with his subsequent decision to raid Nuttanger seeming more like bowing to the inevitable than the audacious and even foolhardy leadership he displays in the book. This Kihar has had no role in discovering the does at Nuttanger, and also will not form the bond with Bigwig that he does in the book. In fact, this Kihar will take a lot longer to become a friend to these rabbits, helping to make this version of Watership Down lack much of the warmth of the original story. Next time, the raids on Nuthanger Farm begin, and Holly has an idea. <laughs>